Not long ago, a techno-marvel smart everything project was going to reinvent cities, starting right on the waterfront of Ontario's capital city. And then it didn't happen. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Seems to be the conclusion of some people who think about cities a lot. Let's find out more from Vass Bedner. She is executive director at McMaster University's Master of Public Policy in Digital Society program. John Lawrence is here, journalist and author of Dream States, Smart Cities, Technology, and the Pursuit of Urban Utopias. And Josh O'Kane, technology reporter for the Globe and Mail, and he's got a book too called Sideways, The City Google Couldn't Buy. Great to have you all around our table here at TVO tonight. Josh, going to put you to work first. All right. We're going to talk about smart cities. Sure. I need you to define what they are. Well, a smart city uh, is kind of a buzzword. When we're thinking about like what the, the realm of possibility of what technology could do for us in like 2007, 2008, these new things called smartphones were suddenly just in everyone's pockets. And people were thinking, well, what could be smart next? And this group of companies, you know, Siemens, Cisco, IBM, wanted to sort of rewire cities and get things like central command centers to really, you know, kind of make cities a little bit more efficient from like the, uh, uh, the way that they're run. That did not necessarily go over well. There were a lot of cost overruns, a few controversies, places like Songdo in South Korea. Uh, it was not necessarily a sort of a great, uh, you know, successor to the smartphone. Hmm. Um, and then in sort of the mid 2010s, seven or eight years later, uh, there was sort of the social media world, and those sort of companies started thinking, well, what can we do for cities? Specifically, with this company called Sidewalk Labs that wanted to build a city from the internet up by thinking about cities from what can we do, you know, for people? What can we re really make the sidewalk itself a lab? And think about how can we, you know embed technologies to make life better for everyday people. But is there such a thing as a smart city? Not necessarily, because no one's really ever actually built one in a successful way that's been celebrated um, as you know something that has made life better for people. So Vass, what would it look like sort of on the ground? If you lived in a smart city or a smart neighborhood, you would therefore what? Well, I guess if we think of smart cities in that binary way that you're either a smart city or you're not, that's where it kind of falls down, right? Because what we're pointing to is the application, targeted application of particular technologies that are meant to enhance our civic life, uh, uh, manage traffic better, manage garbage disposal better, help kind of flow people through a city, try, try to learn from everything that's going on inside a city to, to make cities arguably better, more efficient, better run. So what would it mean if we were living in one? I mean, ideally, you wouldn't necessarily know. Hmm. I, not in the sense that it's deceptive, but everything but would, would be work better. a little bit smoother. Got yeah. It. As you look at a map of the world, can you point to a dot anywhere that says, oh, that's a smart city. They're doing all of those things. Well, there are, I mean, as Josh mentioned, there are places that self-describe as smart cities, like Songo, mm -hmm. uh, South Korea. And um, there, are, you know, there are cities that have invested a lot of money in these technologies. Uh, but I think that the the thing about the smart city label is that it it's actually quite constrained. And, and what cities are is much bigger than that, much more complicated and more uh, resilient to and defiant about the imposition of a set of technologies. Um, and so I think that that's why it's difficult to actually say, OK, well, this is a great working example. Hmm. Does the idea appeal to you, though? I think that um, I think that it's an overly narrow set of solutions to um, the nature of the of urban life, right? It's, uh, you know, I was in Mexico City a couple of weeks ago. It's 22 million people. There are an incredible number of things going on all at the same time. It's a very vibrant place. And I was walking around thinking, there's no way that you could actually kind of come up with an inventory of technologies that manage that space. And, you know, that's a good thing, I think. You prefer the sort of more organic I, way of yeah, work. Yeah, I, I believe in the notion of messy urbanism and that <laughs> it, it's that cities were not meant to be kind of ma managed in a rational way like that. Vast, mm. does the notion of a smart city appeal to you, generally speaking? Uh, elements of a smarter city certainly appeal to me. And I think we hear that from citizens now and then, but not always articulated in that way. So, for instance, with something like uh, speed cameras that we're starting to get used to. Uh, we have expectations that this will be a more kind of efficient, effective application of, you know, 
equitably penalizing people who speed in certain areas. And then as we learn more about them, we realize that they come with additional costs. There's a human element to this. We have to send uh, tickets within 30 days. Uh, sometimes these are turned off. So, you know, the idea that a technological intervention is a substitute for uh, governance, oversight, humans for people in some way, I think that's where it falls apart. Would I like to be able to have my Presto card uh, on my phone so that when I lose it, <laughs> you know, things like that? Like, is that a smart city or is that just a smarter use of technologies that sort of help us get around? I think that's maybe where we can get tripped up in, in some of the conversation. Do you know, I was in New York a few months ago. Yeah. Just for, uh, for a little short trip. You, you can take your smartphone and you can put it over a scanner to go into the subway. You can't do that here yet. Not Why yet. not? I mean, that's a, that's a, a larger question around procurement and, and government yeah. spending than I'm ready to answer, but... It was more of a rhetorical question, I guess. Well, <laughs> one of the smartest things I think we can do as cities is anticipate where uh, these trends are going on the horizon and make sure that we're also being, quote-unquote, smart about the policy environment mm -hmm. and our governance approach to these technologies, and I think that's illuminated in, uh, in both uh, of these books and the work that you're doing. Well, speaking of which, Josh, when you were doing your research for your book, mm -hmm. did you come to a conclusion about whether... I mean, you three think about this stuff for a living. Do you know whether the public is actually interested in living in a quote unquote smart or smarter city? So some of the research that was actually done about what Sidewalk Labs was trying to do in Toronto in partnership with Waterfront Toronto basically showed that, you know, about half of the public wasn't even really aware of what, of what was even happening. Mm -hmm. People are going about their day to day lives mm -hmm. and they just want things to improve their day to day lives. They're not necessarily thinking on these big terms that, you know, people who work for sort of large private companies or are thinking, you know, are, are members of government or thinking about those two sorts of, you know, parts of society are thinking about all the time. So it, it doesn't, it, it's not necessarily something that everyone wants. I think everyone would love the idea of, you know, you know, heated sidewalks uh, that sort of, you know, make your bike lanes safe and dry in the middle of winter, which is something that Sidewalk Labs <laughs> propose, but that often gets lost in the mix of well, what are we supposed to be thinking about? Like, what order should we be thinking about all of these things when we want to propose a smart city in the first place? And hmm. that goes to Vass's point about should we be thinking about policy in the first place? You know, about things like, say, privacy. You know, the word censor showed up dozens of times in Sidewalk Lab's original response to the request of proposals that Waterfront Toronto put out that led to this whole project in the first place. And so, you know, there are a lot of really big implications that you know, perhaps governments uh, should be thinking about before they embark on these sort of big, shiny, glossy projects. Okay, having said that, Vast, can you think of any examples in one of the bigger cities of this province of Ontario where technology has been brought to bear to, I don't care if it's for, for road construction or garbage pickup or whatever, I mean, pick a problem. Technology was brought to bear, they came up with a solution, things work better. So in terms of technology coming first and then that catalyzing a policy response? Yeah. No, I can't, I can't come up with that, but maybe I could point to something that John tackles in his book, which is uh, wastewater surveillance. That's mm -hmm. an application of technology where arguably we've become used to anonymized, aggregated data giving us key public health indicators. Um, and it's not something that we necessarily incorporate into our vision of what it means to be quote unquote smart, but it's us using new indicators that we didn't have before. And it's a form of kind of soft surveillance. So are we viewing that as a success? There are scholars who are making the very important point that we actually don't quite yet have the right governance regime uh, for this approach. But at the same time, you haven't seen the kind of citizen resistance to it that we saw and that we've seen in other jurisdictions opposing the applications of these new hmm. technologies. You want to speak to that? Because that was big during COVID. Yeah, yeah. And and that's an example where the, you know, where there's there's a set of technologies like water sampling and um, and a public policy objective uh, and, uh, you know, sort of a, you know, way of disseminating the information. So it's, it actually, I think it's a really good example. I mean, another example, which I think has a great deal of promise and uses digital technology more is mm. um, managing electrical grids, right? So yeah. to decarbonize, we, if we, if you live in an area where, uh, hydro, where electricity is clean, like Ontario, you want to move as much away from natural gas and fossil fuels to electricity. But managing the electrical grid is really, really complicated. And there are interesting emerging and, you know, in-use technologies that, you know, that are able to sort of 
uh, you know, adjust loads. And, um, you know, so I have, for example, I have, uh, you know, a smart thermostat in my house, which has an app on my phone. Which means what? Which means that it, it automatically adjusts. It's got sensors in the house. And it, it, so I don't have to do anything about it. It keeps the temperature right. And, um, and then it also feeds data on my energy consumption to the company, which uses it for uh, research purposes. And, mm. um, you know, helps to assess, you know, what energy loads are like, um, you know, when people are using more electricity. And that's a kind of application which I think is um, smart um, and it's necessary, right? Yeah. It's not surveillance and... Well, okay, that's what I want to follow up on because that's theore theoretically when you use your power right. in your home is kind of private proprietary information right. of yours. And yet you don't mind sharing that with the company that's providing you that so, electricity. So the so I thought about that before I um, opted for the sharing, and they have a protocol which anonymizes the data, right? So um, so you know my customer information is not part of the usage data that's that they sort of gather from lots of homes and try to you know do their calculations around load you know and all those things so i think that that's really important it was a question that sidewalk you know i think josh talks about this in his book a lot that they didn't really address in a in a persuasive way well okay and that you, was a political problem you are leading me nicely to where we want to go next which is and we do want to talk about how sidewalk went sideways because initially this whole thing was unveiled. You've given an example here of one very specific example in your very specific life. Sidewalk was going to build a whole community down at the waterfront in Toronto, which would have incorporated this idea and so many others into what was going to be a very smart neighborhood. And the appeal immediately among many political leaders, Josh, in this town was off the charts. A lot of people dove in. What did they love about it? Uh, I think if you have to take a little bit of a step back about that, uh, when you're thinking about what the world looked like in 2015, which sometimes seems like yesterday, mm -hmm. but was actually seven years ago, um, when Sidewalk Labs was sort of beginning, is just before this thing that was called the tech clash, where people started getting a little bit more paranoid about what might be collected about them, uh, there was nothing more progressive than a job at Google or Facebook or Twitter. These really looked progressive in a sense that they were sort of advancing society uh, sort of in a technological way. But technical progress is not necessarily political progress. Uh, but people who wanted to have the optics of looking politically progressive, uh, such as, uh, you know, we had a liberal prime minister and, uh, you know, a, a liberal premier at the time in 2017 mm -hmm. uh, when Sidewalk Labs first walked into Toronto. And, and you know, it was Kathleen Wynne. Yeah, Kathleen Wynne and Justin Trudeau and John Tory, uh, sort of a centrist, I guess. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was, it, the optics were great. You got to, you got a co-sign from one of the biggest and most interesting companies in the world. As a result, there was very, very, very little scrutiny given by any of those levels of government when Sidewalk Labs walked to town. Then, after Sidewalk Labs started running into controversy, when very smart people, some of whom appeared on this show, uh, started asking, you know, what, how is this data going to be used? Should we be putting, uh, how is data that's going to be collected while these sensors they're describing in this RFP, you know, how is that going to necessarily be used? All these governments were like, oh, wait, should we do something about this? And in the end, they, they didn't. You know, that was 2017. It's 2022. Mm -hmm. And as an example, uh, you know, the federal government is still like trying to figure out how to update its now 22-year-old uh, private sector privacy law to even deal with. That's not even equipped to deal with social media as it existed in 2007. Let alone let, today. Let alone today. Yeah. When the whole Sidewalk Labs project first came on the horizon, what did you think? I remember there being a great deal of buzz about it. The, the lash didn't uh, come out the gate, I think, as strong. Uh, certainly people were starry-eyed wanting to learn more, uh, thirsty for more information. Maybe not as thirsty as the political class for this very elusive thing called innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think once people wanted to, you know, click further down, read more, understand it better, it became clear that uh, there was a little bit of spaghetti at the wall, right? There was a tension between the current regulatory environment and the regulatory environment we needed in the future. There was ambiguity about intellectual property rights the best kind of vehicles for, for data ownership. So I remember following everything with great interest and also really paying attention to how we presented power in the city, right? You had uh, coalitions of former mayors, you had major urbanists signing letters, you know, in the Globe and Mail, and you also had everyday people kind of demanding more and asking really important and tough questions. And I think a question still for me going forward is, 
did Toronto, you know, make enough use of that opportunity to really keep thinking about the policy environment that we need in the future for smart cities? Just because Sidewalk Labs is in here doesn't mean that this suite of technologies, there's still tons of research, innovation, lobbying, procurement all around making cities smarter. But that, that, that's what I'm getting at. You're a tech person. Like, you, you're, you don't hate tech, right? You don't start from a default position of hating tech. So I wondered whether you were kind of very turned on by this idea of a smart neighborhood on the waterfront. Was I turned on by it? I was certainly, like, very intrigued by elements. Yeah. For sure. What, what could we learn? What's it going to look like? Heated sidewalk comes up a lot. I think some of the, the garbage elements. Uh, hmm. Maybe it's a function of my age and being hmm. a millennial and where I was in the city. The proportion of uh, deep affordability, I think, was a fascinating aspect. Hmm. And yeah, being a, a tech policy person, I have a healthy amount of uh, skepticism, but I also care about having the right rules in place. I think the right rules make things better for everyone, companies included. Now, when you saw the plans at first blush, what did you think? So. Uh, I've been covering waterfront revitalization for a uh, very long time, and so I was I was really interested in seeing what um, you know what the built form was going to look like in it. So I remember actually sitting in a coffee shop, uh, reading that. How, how long was the PDF? Like 150 pages. 225. Yeah. 225. The original one. And um, thinking, there's a lot of language in there which just is very kind of out of step with what waterfront was. Toronto was doing in terms of its own plans for re revitalizing the waterfront. So it immediately struck me as a change in direction. And then the other thing that struck me um, is that the, the, the way they conceptualized the, uh, what they were trying to do, building a city from the internet up, um, struck me as being not unlike the app store on your uh, smartphone, that, that they, would, they would have all these people in the space, all these users, and that they would kind of allow, you know, tech companies, software developers to come in, use that information and turn it into some kind of service. And it was sort of seemed very open-ended to me. And then the third thing, um, and you know, I mean, you talk about this in your book, is that the word lab did not appeal to me at all. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in city building, which I don't think is, um, and I, I mean, it, it, it has experimental components to it, but when you build a city, you want the city to be there. And, um, and so it, to me, it felt very provisional, um, and that's, that, those were my first reactions. In a way, Josh, I'm kind of asking you, uh, I mean, to, to do in the next minute and a half what you've taken 350 pages to do in the book, which is to say, at first, this looked like it had a lot of the elements that Torontonians would like. Mm -hmm. It was futuristic looking. It was a, a big American company from New York coming up here saying, we want to make Toronto this, this jewel on the waterfront to show mm -hmm. the whole world. And Toronto's got such a complex about being a world-class city, so it fit into all of that, right? But at some point, it went off the rails. And ultimately, obviously, it didn't happen. When did it start to go off the rails? Uh, as soon as Sidewalk Labs and Waterfront in Toronto started speaking, it was very clear that there were uh, a di there was a divergence in what you know they wanted. Sidewalk Labs, prior to ever coming to Toronto, was thinking about basically building, you know, imprinting a whole new city just like all over Detroit or you know, on the outskirts of Denver um, or you know over a piece of the Bay Area, just plopping a new city with a dome on top of it. At one point, was one of their ideas. Um, and then Waterfront Toronto said, you know, we've got 12 acres. Would you would you like 12 acres? And we're going to have this contest for it. Um, and Sidewalk Labs easily won that contest. But Sidewalk Labs is a Google affiliate company, was a Google affiliate company. Now it's part of Google because it doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. Um, and Google is an enormously ambitious uh, company that wrote the rules of the internet economy. And the real life world of cities and democracies is a lot more rigid and messier than that. And so right from the beginning, you had a company that wanted more than 12 acres throughout their request for proposals response and in stuff that I got over the course of reporting on the book, stuff that was never made public, they had made it clear they wanted a significant chunk of the portlands in the Eastern waterfront. Mm -hmm. um, and that fundamentally was what the greatest misalignment was. What multiple people from you know all sides of this refer to as the original sin of the project was, this was this sort of boring, uh, bureaucratic, Canadian, tripartite government agency up against you know, this sort of brand new side project of one of the most maverick-like companies ever to exist. And so there was constant clashes over who was going to present ideas versus approving them, and particularly around land, because 
you know, Google thinks big. It wants scale in tech parlance. Mm. And Waterfront Toronto was really only prepared or even really legally able to give it the 12 acres. And then they would have to go through the very slow slog of sort of Toronto city building processes um, in order to be able to get anything more. And that was just didn't work out. So there's all that. And then, John, pick up the story from there. How much, in addition to all of that, was the notion that we're going to give up a lot of our personal proprietary information to this company and we're not really, we're, we're not satisfied exactly what's going to be used with it. How much of that was part of the story? Well, I think that that was, that was really a driving force in the story. And there were, you know, there were activists and, you know, people who were asking really important questions about, uh, you know, how do you, you know, when you're walking through public space and, you know, there are sensors all around, you know, how are you giving consent to them collecting information on you, right? Like, you know, I have a dog. Why does anybody need to know that I'm taking my dog for a walk and what that route is, right? It's And what was know, the answer to that question? Why did they want to know that information? Because the, the business model, which never actually materialized, but the idea was that if you aggregate a lot of information, like you, you collect a massive amount of data and then you let you know, software developers have a go at it and see what they can do with it, then you can come up with kind of things that help the city, solutions that help the city, and that these are very tech connected. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the sort of thinking and that, you know, and they, they said, you know, they had a privacy commissioner on staff for a while, or privacy advisor on mm -hmm. staff. And they said, okay, well, you know, no names, we're gonna anonymize everything. but. You know, in reality, you can de-anonymize data. You can you can you could use aggregated data for the wrong reasons, right? You can, you know, if you have, you know, if you surveil a park um, and you have sensors on park benches, for example, and you discover that there is a lot of activity at four o'clock in the morning on one particular park bench, you don't necessarily know who, but you can take steps to act on that information if you're the local government or if you're the condo board or whatever. So. Um, so I think that their, their arguments were not persuasive about privacy protections. And, you know, as Josh mentioned, it came after Cambridge Analytica. It came after, you know, there was like a big wake up call about, uh, about you know, what how, tech, the fangs how, using how far tech can yeah. reach into your life. Yeah. And how far should tech reach into a city? I mean, I want tech in the city, right? Tech is an important part. It builds our cities. Um, but there is a balance, right? And I don't think that they found a balance. Well, let's find out from Vass about that. When we use surveillance technology, which sounds more nefarious than perhaps it was intended to be, mm. is there inevitably, at the end of the day, going to be a fight about privacy? Absolutely. I mean, we've already heard this point that Canada has yet to fully update its federal privacy laws. We've been talking about the sidewalk labs uh, plan using that word plan. I think it was much closer to a pitch, something that's much more suitable for a venture capitalist audience in terms of on spec, on the promise of this vision. We're ready to fund you and we're ready to go forward. And uh, Josh makes this point in his book very well. We saw behaviors that are very common to the digital economy where private companies have written the rules, such as app stores, spill over into into our analog world, and they just didn't fit as well there. So yes, in, if we want to proceed with you know, surveillance technology for good or for the people, we're going to need better regulatory environments for people, but we also need to consider the competition implications. So a lot of my research focuses on competition, right? And we miss some of that. And John touches on this in, in his book. Some of the downsides of smart cities, potentially. Vendor lock-in, interoperability. What does all this mean? Costs. Things like uh, if in your TVO city, you sign a contract with, you know, John Sensors, and you're either locked in in perpetuity, his business goes out of business, so you can't get an upgrade, he changes the price on you, you can't then uh, buy camera sensors from Josh's company, right? You want to maintain flexibility, mm -hmm. you want to allow for true competition, and you don't want uh, municipalities to be on the hook in particular ways. We missed a little bit of that out the gate because certainly all of these companies are kind of fighting in, in kind of an arms race to become the de facto product and service provider of the quote unquote idealized smart city mm -hmm. um, because that's uh, a revenue stream for them as well. Mm -hmm. Josh, you, you've chronicled how it went down. Mm -hmm. Is there a part of you in telling the story that regrets that it didn't happen. 
I mean, it, it's interesting, right? Because like I'm a technology reporter, I fundamentally like sort of bask myself in sort of the technology of these companies. I carry a smartphone, I use a computer, I cannot get around city without Google Maps. Um, you know, to me, the idea of making city life better through technology, uh, you know, is a, a way to make cities more equitable and more inclusive. Um, you know, but for me, I guess, you know, I, you know, as a reporter, I tried not to sort of be prescriptive, but I, you know, I think there was a missed opportunity in that this could have, you know, if this were thought through in a meaningful way on a partnership that was equal on all sides, that we could have had, you know, I really enjoyed covering this story because there was so much at stake and so many people who had just very emotional responses to everything that it felt very much like this battle over how, you know, power will be exerted in 21st century cities over the next hundreds of years. Um, and so as a reporter, I, you know, enjoyed covering that. And I think we would have really had, Toronto could have been the center, not necessarily of, you know, shiny new technologies, but the center of, you know, debate about the future of what we want in society and what we should be prioritizing and what we want our governance and governments rather to, to prioritize. Gotcha. That was a great discussion, everybody. Do you mind if I plug your book here? No. I didn't think you would. That's John Lawrence. Dream State, Smart Cities, Technology, and the Pursuit of Urban Utopias is his latest contribution to this subject. And on the other side of the table, Vast Bednar, who is the master of everything at McMaster University. And uh, Sideways, The City Google Couldn't Buy is Josh O'Kane's contribution to this. And we are delighted that it has brought the three of you into our studio here at TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.